Good morning and welcome to Valley Community Church. Typically this room would be full. We'd have a music team on the platform and, and the seats would be full of people. We'd be lifting up our voices together as we gather and we hope to be able to do that again soon. But in the meantime, we hope that you stay safe and healthy and encouraged and try to communicate the best ways possible. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, we'd like to encourage you to stay in touch. If you go to our website, uh, valleycommunityco.org, you can email us and we can put you on our weekly mail out. We have a Monday memo that goes out and let you know of the various activities. We're meeting in some smaller groups and on Zoom. And some of you are probably Zoomed out, but we'd still like to have you join us on Wednesday at seven o'clock as we have just a half hour together of praying and catching up with one another. Tomorrow night, Monday night, is a ladies' gathering. You can also find out about that. Every Monday morning, we have a verse of the week. I'll take about three to five minutes and share a devotional on uh, a particular verse that we want to memorize and meditate on together. What's well, been pretty exciting that even though we've not been able to meet, God's still at work in many ways. We've seen several people come to faith in Christ over the last several weeks. And we're going to have a baptism coming up on Saturday, the 1st of August. And if you're interested in that, then just email me and let me know. We'll probably do it outside at a lake and we'll keep our social distancing as best as we can. But we're going to move on with that type of thing. If you've never been baptized, baptism is not salvation and it really has no part of salvation, but it is the first step of obedience for a new Christian. When you have put your faith and trust in Jesus alone for eternal life, this is your public testimony. This is your public statement of identification with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And if you'd like to talk about that, I'd like for you to be convinced in your own mind that this is scriptural, biblical, what God would have you to do it at the right time. So if you're interested, please let us know. I'd like to take a little moment and Pray for us as we begin our service, and then we'll break away to our music team. It'll lead us, lead us in worship. And then this morning, we're coming to the very end. We have two more messages this morning and next week that will conclude the greatest sermon ever preached by Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount, and that we'll find in Matthew chapter 7. Let's bow together. We look to you, Lord, as you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are the eternal God who has created and does sustain all things. It is our desire to come into your presence with thanksgiving and praise for all you have done, all you are doing, and all you have promised to do. Our faith is weak, and so we ask you to help us. Help us to believe what we know to be true and turn our backs on the lies that are spoken by the devil, our own sinful nature, and the fallen world we live in. We thank you especially for the privilege that we have to meet together today to encourage one another. We pray for those in our church family who are presently being challenged in various ways, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and financially. We pray for those in this city and around the world who still need Jesus. We pray for our national and community leaders we have been asking for a more permanent place to meet. You know that, Lord, as well as an opportunity to gather together again soon in a safe and God-honoring way. Bless this hour. Bless our global partners around the world and friends who are everywhere as they worship you today. Open our hearts to your word and to praise you with all that we have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Worship Valley Community Church. We're glad that you've joined us and we sing this morning of the name that is above all other names, the one that fills our hearts with wonder. We sing of this morning, this is Bill.
would think the ocean filled or were the skies of parchment made where every song on earth of will and every man described by dream I'm sure you've heard this term in recent days, fake news. And I wondered what actually is fake news? I looked all over the internet, of course, you can't always trust that either. What was the beginning of this fake news? It seems to me that fake news is when I hear something that I really don't believe, and yet it's coming across as very authoritative. And I think both sides of any issue can claim that the other is spouting off fake news. And I sometimes wonder as I try to gather my news from various sources, hoping to eliminate various political agendas or controversies, but still I wonder what really is the truth. Even when people speak with great education and great authority and great experience, a lot of times what they say does not come to be true. And so it makes you stop and wonder. And I think that's that way with just about everything that we hear in this world. How can you trust it? How do you know if that's true? And I think only time will tell. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. It says, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Think about that. Some translations say every word of God is true, but a literal translation is every word of God proves to be true. In other words, in time, if you let this play out, what God says will always prove to be true. And that's a great encouragement because when we have a, a swirling opinions and arguments and certain science that everybody claims that their opinion is science, it can be very unsettling. And that's what I find the scripture does for us every Sunday or every morning when you open up God's word. It, it is very settling to us because we know it is true and it will always prove to be true. 
Now, Jesus is coming to the end, the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount. He has startled his hearers because he has challenged them with this thought that what you've heard before is not always true, and what you've seen and what you appear to think is not always true. But I'm telling you what is authentic Christianity and authentic righteousness. So he's contrasted these things throughout this sermon. And he's coming down to this final stretch, and we have some hard sayings, but he's really challenging the people to follow him. We began that theme in chapter 4, and it continues throughout the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus looks at these people and he says, follow me. He, there is a call to fo follow him. So that is the voice that we hear from Jesus. But we're also going to hear a lot of other voices, a lot of other opinions. We're going to hear from Satan. We heard this in, in the third chapter of Genesis when he was trying to get Eve to follow him, Adam to follow him. And so how do we distinguish? How, how do we really understand what's going on? And I think that for many of us, there, there might be reason to be afraid. But I think I, I come to the the conclusion and the thesis for this message that we need to be aware, but we do not need to be afraid. Let's look at the text that we have this morning. It's found in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 15 to 20. It says, Be on your guard against false prophets or false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. So this is what he is saying. You need to be circumspect. You need to be aware. You need to be alert. You need to be on your guard. So be aware, but you need not be afraid. Let's look at five ways I see that we need from this passage to be aware of false teachers. This is his challenge. He said, follow me. He expects us to follow him. He invites us into his life. He has the way of eternal life and abundant and full life here on earth. But he says there will be other voices shouting at you, calling to you, trying to convince you, and it's fake news. So five ways that we see that we need to be aware of these false teachers. First, be aware of their existence. Be aware of the existence of false teachers. He says in verse 15, be on your guard against false prophets who have come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. A prophet or a teacher, particularly in the Old Testament, was someone who was sent by God to speak in behalf of God. A false prophet would be someone who is neither. He's neither been sent by God and he is not speaking for God. So how do you know? The fact is, the reality that all around us, we're going to have voices that we need to judge and discern in healthy ways. The present reality we've talked about in Ephesians chapter 6, and that's been part of our verse of the week. We've been going through this little section, and it's called spiritual warfare, putting on the armor of God. And we need to recognize that there are unseen realities there is a spiritual warfare going on all around us, and the warfare is for your soul. It is for your life. And we need to recognize the seriousness of this ongoing spiritual and unseen battle. There are false teachers everywhere. Note what it says in Ephesians 6. It says, finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And he goes on to say, put on the armor of God, take this seriously, that we are at war with false teachers. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11, Jesus said, many false prophets will arise and will deceive many. In Acts chapter 20 and verses 28 to 30, it says, be on guard for yourselves and for the flock which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. So he's talking to pastors, be on, be on guard for your flock. And he says he has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And then he says, I know that after my departure, this is Paul speaking, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. So it's not just out in the world. It's not just on television. It's just not the secular media or unbelieving people. These false teachers come into the church and they prey on people. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. So, our first point, be aware of the existence of, of false teachers. Our second point is we need to be aware of the expression of false teachers. How, how does a false teacher express himself? What do you see when he or she is expressing their false teaching? What does it look like? In verse 15 you'll note that it says, they come to you in sheep's clothing. Now it's interesting, I, I have this picture in my mind of a, a wolf that has a sheepskin over him going into the middle of all the sheep and tricking them and then devouring them. But, but what it's actually saying is sheep's clothing is what a shepherd wears. A shepherd wears wool. And so the sheep know the shepherd and they trust the shepherd. The shepherd provides their food. You read Psalm 23 and you just see all that the shepherd does for the sheep. And the sheep completely and absolutely trust their shepherd. And so what do, do the false teachers look like? Well, they just look just like a shepherd. They, they mirror that appearance and they come away with that expression, deceptively so. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, it describes what Satan looks like. Now, when I have in my mind what the devil looks like, he's got horns, he's got a tail, he's red, he's vicious, he has a pitchfork, he's coming to destroy your life. But a false teacher does not look that way. A false teacher, I would say, looks nice, charming, winsome, articulate, and they're smooth as butter. Satan is described in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 as he comes among us as an angel of light. An angel of light. That's his appearance. So his whole manner is tricking, deceiving. He is a father of lies. He is a master of this. And what do they say? What does a false, false teacher say? And typically we think a false teacher is going to say, I don't believe in God, or I don't believe in Jesus, or I don't believe in the Bible, right? They, they say some heretical thing, and you, and, and you say, no, I'm not going to have anything to do with that person or that teacher. I'm going to turn that television off. I'm going to put that book aside. But here's, here's what happens. A false teacher will speak mostly truth. They will speak mostly truth things that you love to hear, things that you resonate with, things that get you nodding your head. And they will insert enough poison to destroy the whole of it. 
And that's why we need to be aware of this, to be aware of the, their tactics and the way that they enter into our lives to, to tempt us. Very little error, but enough error to destroy us. Many times I will say, and I'll read a book, someone will hand me a book and they'll say, read this, what do you think? And, and everything that I read in the book I agree with, but it's what they leave out. And they leave out what is essential for knowing God, or essential for knowing Christ and walking with Christ, or essential what God has said about the Christian faith. They gloss over the scriptures. I find this too, that very, very few times do these false teachers really root their message in the text of Scripture. Many times they, they don't have an education, and I, I'm not saying that every preacher, teacher has to have uh, a formal education, but that has been the history of the church, that the pastors are usually the most educated people in the community because they really take what God says seriously. If, if every word of God proves true and is a shield to those that put their trust in him, if this is the way that Christians grow, then a pastor ought to be leading his people through the scriptures, he himself understanding the scriptures, helping them to see it and own it for themselves. Many times they'll say, well, just trust me. I'll tell you what the Bible says. They also prey on you. And I think in two particular ways, there are other ways, but I think two particular ways that a false teacher will prey on the sheep. One, they prey on your desires. You know, every, every person wants to be financially secure. Every person wants to be healthy. Everyone wants to have good fortune. That may not be God's will for your life. I can't say to you that it's God's will that I be rich. What biblical basis would I have for that? God has promised that he would provide every need that I have, but I'm not living for this world. I'm living for eternity. I'm living for heaven. But you know, that message of if you do this and do this, you can be wealthy or you can have perfect health. There's so many examples in scripture and in modern life of people that love God, walk with God, who are not rich and they are not healthy. That doesn't mean they've sinned against God or have done something wrong. But a false teacher will prey on that. The good fortune, everything to go well, life will smooth out. And so anyone that hears this positive thinking, positive talk, can be swept into, I want that. I want money, I want health, I want good fortune. And so that they start listening to everything else. So he knows your desires and what you want to hear. That's so why I talked about earlier, the itching ears. It's like, I know what I want to hear. And I think back to a great story in the Old Testament. It's found in 1 Kings 22. There's the king of Israel is named Ahab. And the king of Judah is Jehoshaphat. And they're all part of God's people, but they're separate, separate kingdoms, one in the north and one in the south. And the, the, the king of Aram is going to attack um, Ahab and Israel. And so he goes into this alliance with Jehoshaphat and says, you know, let's, let's fight together. So yeah, let's go fight together. Well, we need, we need to consult the Lord. You know, it's a good thought. Now, ne neither one of these kings were noted for their great spirituality. At times they had moments of this, but they thought, you know, we need, we need to really seek the Lord. And so all the prophets, they got all the prophets together. Yeah, go up and fight, go up and fight. You're gonna win the victory, um, every prophet. And, and so Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, he says, is that all the prophets you have? Is there any other prophets? And Ahab says, well, there's, there's one other prophet. His name is Micaiah, but he never tells me what I wanna hear. Every time I ask him, he tells me what I don't wanna hear. And so Jehoshaphat says, well, we need to hear from him. So they, they drag in Micaiah and they say, Micaiah, what's going to happen? What, what does God say? And he says, go up and you will win mightily. <laughs> and uh, Ahab says, tell me the truth. I want to know the truth. And, and Micaiah says, you're going to go in and you're going to die in battle. and You're going to lose this battle. And the response of Ahab is, see, see, see I told you, he never tells me what I want to hear. Now, typically, we can get sucked into that. We find counselors and advisors, 
radio stations, TV stations, books that tell us what we want to hear. But it's not true. And so Satan plays on your desires. Here's a second way that he, he plays on you. He preys on you and plays on you. Is that he's going after your doubts. I think in the Christian faith, there are times where we doubt. You know, is God there? Does God really love me? Is he able to help me? And if, if we're called to live and walk by faith, we are going to have that faith challenge and we're going to have doubts. And so he's going to find out where you're struggling. Maybe you went through some experience and you're starting to question. And so he just feeds that question. You remember in the Garden of Eden when uh, Satan is, is coming to Eve and and uh, she says, well, God, God said this. And, and Satan says to her, did God really say that? Did God really say that? And so he feeds that doubt. And he just pulls us in, desires and doubt. So how does a false teacher, a false prophet, really live? And I, and I think of this when I think of his expression, how they come across. Uh, usually... They're wealthy. <laughs> um, they live at a higher standard of living. I think it's a bit strange, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong to have money. And in fact, I don't think that it's wrong for a person who is in ministry, a pastor, a missionary, to, to be wealthy. I just don't see much of that. Uh, most, most people that go into ministry to serve the Lord have one thing on their mind, to serve God, to declare the good news of eternal life to the ends of the earth, and trust God to take care of them. But what I find with a lot of these uh, people that they live at a much higher standard of living than their people do. And that doesn't seem right. That's something that I've noticed. I also notice that they live often by a different set of rules. In other words, what they expect out of the people that they're preaching to, they don't do themselves. We call that hypocrisy. And that's what Jesus was judging the religious leaders, the false teachers of his day was for their incredible hypocrisy. You are putting heavy burdens on these people. You don't carry them yourselves. I also see a modern day prophets and false teachers as being marketers. It's, uh, it's like a business, it's a big business. And they commercialize the gospel. And I think that that's happened all throughout history but I think more so in the last hundred years, we see that in America, almost everywhere we turn, we see the Christian faith as some enterprise. It is a building some big business. And it, and it doesn't really build up people, it builds up the business at the expense of the people. Let me give you a little picture of history. I heard this once, I don't know if I have exactly the way it was quoted. But uh, the early church, if we were to look at the first century church, what would be described as a community, a gathering, a family. Uh, we're called Valley Community Church, and that's what really church means is community. It's, it's a family, it's a relationship. And, and really, the church was not defined by money or buildings or success. It was defined by relationships. And then the Greeks got a hold of Christianity, and they turned it into a philosophy. The Romans turned it into an institution the Roman church. The Europeans turned it into a culture. And finally, the Americans. <laughs> the Americans turned it into an enterprise. So I would say beware of some teacher who expresses himself or herself in these ways. And so here we are. We're in this 21st century. We have many in our country today that I believe are false prophets, false teachers, speaking an abundance of truth, but have enough lie to destroy the entirety of the gospel message. And people are led astray because they're not in God's word. They don't rest in the truth, but they listen to those voices, not to the voice of Jesus who says, follow me. So existence, expression, in the third point, we say we be aware of false teachers and their effect. How does a false teacher affect us? Well, in verse 15, you read these words, it says, they are ravaging wolves. In other words, they are hungry, raging, vicious wolves. In verse 13, we go back to this, it says, they are leading us to destruction. 
and eternal destruction. They have an agenda, and they are working hard to destroy just like a vicious wolf. Some of you have heard this story, but a couple weeks ago, we got a very alarming text from our daughter-in-law overseas in Palau. And apparently, our three-year-old grandson, Landon, and his older sister, Eliana, who's five, were just out in the front yard picking some limes. And Reed and Heather, the parents, were inside, <clears throat> just in the house, and all of a sudden, they heard this screaming and barking and growling. So Reed races out into the front yard in his bare feet and sees about seven or eight dogs what appears to be on top of three-year-old Landon and just viciously ripping away at him. Eliana had run, stumbled, got up, and got into the back of a pick pickup truck, and she was screaming. You can imagine being a dad, knowing what dogs do when they, they go in packs, and this is the way it is in much of the world. They're not just pets that you have on a leash or in your yard, the dogs run loose, and when they get together in packs, they turn into wild, raging, angry animals. And so he runs out <clears throat> and sees these seven to eight dogs just ripping away at Landon. And, and I can't even imagine the horror as he is beating and kicking these dogs off, which took quite a bit, and even at his own expense of getting cut up but finally drove them off and, and looks down and you think, what am I gonna find? And, and uh, rolled him over and the dogs had not eaten at his face or his throat or his abdomen, typically, or, or his limbs. And typically when wild dogs will attack something, they will go immediately for the throat, the abdomen and the face uh, and, and the limbs. I'm, I'm thinking 30 seconds longer and Landon would be gone. That's how, that's how quickly this was happening. He had a number of bites uh, on his back and his hip that required stitches and will leave some, some good scars on him, but he's safe and protected. And I think this of, of a dad, and I'm sure Heather was there. You say, well, she's pregnant, she's in the house. I'll guarantee you, she would have, if Reed was not there, she would have died trying to get those dogs off and probably would have. But you see, when, when we're vulnerable, like, like little land, we're vulnerable. And Satan, he wants to do everything in his power to destroy what is dear to you. Every relationship, your marriage, your family, your kids, your walk with God, your joy in your life. And he doesn't play by any rules. He just goes out to seek and to destroy. But there was a rescuer, is like a shepherd. Reed was like a shepherd that comes in and protects and rescues. And I, I feel there's a, a greater shepherd who is watching over him, which the Lord always watches over us. How could it not be true that God was miraculously walking, watching over Landon and protecting him? I just, it's, it's an amazing story, one we hope, and hope never happens again. Many of you have had experiences like this that just kind of make your heart stop. But Jesus is that shepherd and as under shepherds, pastors, teachers, prophets, we should minister the same way of protecting the flock and not ravaging it. But this is really their end of what they want to do. All along, they're looking to play the part and look like a trusted shepherd, but inwardly, they're going to devour you. So be aware, but don't be afraid. Fourth, be aware of the evidence of false teachers. How do you know that's a false teacher or a true teacher? I mean, that's a tough thing. I'm, saying, I'm, I'm looking at that, a nice smile. He got, they combed his hair. He's got a nice suit on. He's, you know, friendly. How, how do you know? How can you tell? We're challenged in this day and time with all the voices around us to be discerning. What's a true teacher? What's a false teacher? And... We need to go by the evidence. He said, how do you know? How can you tell? Well, he tells us right here in verse 16, it says, you'll recognize them by their fruit. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Then he goes on to say, uh, a good tree will produce good fruit. Fruit. A bad tree will produce bad fruit. He says, thorns and thistles, they don't produce fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. And that's speaking of the judgment. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. 
So you ask, what is fruit? Um, fruit is really, you talk about the fruit of your hands, the fruit of your lips, the fruit of your ways. It's the evidence. It's, it's, the, it's what you see. Uh, and, and John 15, which is, a, which is a great chapter, I wish I had time to digress into chapter 15 because it's all about fruit. And he describes this picture when Jesus is on his way from the upper room, Last Supper, with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. He stops and gives this message and probably is holding grapes in his hand and he's talking about this. He says, in the vineyard, the Father, the Heavenly Father, is the gardener. He, he owns everything. The vine is Jesus. The vine is what flows with life. And the branch, that's you and me, the branch will produce fruit out here as it abides in the vine. So you find this word abide or continue or remain. So he says, if, if you continue in me, abide in me, and my words, my words are abiding in you. In other words, his word is running through our mind, running through our heart, responding to obedience. He says, you're going to bear fruit. And fruit is really what you, you see over time in a person's life. Uh, I would say this, the fruit of your mouth, that you confess that Jesus is not only Savior, Lord, Master, and King. There is no other way. A false teacher will say, well, there might be another way. Or there might be another thing. But it is confessing with your mouth, not being ashamed to testify that Jesus is Savior, Lord, Master, and King. The fruit of your hands, the fruit of your feet, that you, that you do what is right. Someone who follows Jesus will walk in obedience. They don't live a reckless life. They don't live a disobedient life. And, and I'm not saying you never sin, but I'm saying that, that obedience is the what you're always turning back to. It is the regular acti activity of your life. And you slip into sin, uh, you fall back sometimes, but you're not leaping into it and staying into it. What characterizes a someone following Jesus is they walk like Jesus. They follow him, they follow his ways. And the fruit of your life, Galatians chapter five, another great passage, it talks about the fruit of the spirit. In other words, when when you receive Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence and produces fruit in your life. And there are, there are nine of these, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what, that's what a Christian looks like. That is fruit. So we come to our, our final uh, point here, the fifth. Be aware of the end of false teachers. What is the end? He says in verse 19, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Let me just read briefly here from 2 Peter, uh, and it talks about the end times. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, it says, there were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved ways and the way of truth will be maligned because of them. They will exploit you in their greed with made up stories. Their condemnation pronounced long ago is not idle and their destruction does not sleep. So what did we say is the end for Satan and his demons? Remember last week we were talking about this, that God created hell and the lake of fire, not for people, but for Satan and his demons. But as they head to hell and the lake of fire, the false teachers follow them and will bring as many people with them as possible. Jesus says, follow me. Follow me to eternal life and abundant life. And everyone in the world has that invitation. Everyone in this world has that opportunity. I don't understand how that works, but I know that God says that. He loves the entire world. He's made the offer to the entire world. He reaches out to the entire world, but he will not force you to follow him. You need to choose to follow him. And that's why we're coming down to this, this end and he's saying, make up your mind. There are two ways to live, there are two gates, there are two roads, there are two crowds, and there are two destinations.
follow me. But he won't force it. The one road leads to eternal life, the other to eternal destruction. You know, that should, that should motivate us. To, it should motivate us to, to live in light of eternity and be unashamed to share this good news with every person we care about. So we've looked at five ways we need to beware. So be aware, beware, be conscious, be alert, be sober-minded, be circumspect. The existence, false teachers are all around us. The expression, they're smooth as butter. The effect, they're going to destroy you like wild dogs, like a wolf. The evidence, if there is not fruit, as the Bible describes, there is not root. And they'll be cast into the fire. And their end is destruction. Well, that's a sobering reality. And it, it gives us pause. But I think the takeaway for me is with all the fake news and the fake newscasters and the fake teachers and prophets and pastors that are in this world... Uh, we could become incredibly unsettled. So the challenge I leave with you is this. Be aware, but do not be afraid. May God add his blessing of his word to our hearts today. Father, thank you for teaching us, helping us, protecting us. Help us to discern what is true and right, to know that every word proves true and we can trust in you and you be our shield. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.